Greetings, spooks, danglers, and assets in Her Majesty's service. We mean you no harm. Welcome to this episode of The Tech, where we talk and you listen. You sit there and listen and eat that oatmeal. Welcome, breakfast goers. Welcome, dinner goers. How many of you guys eat? Post in the comments what you eat. Okay? It'll be, it'll be a feast. I have no idea. Let's just get started with some fast stuff. We're going to start off with some funny Apple articles, because Apple's doing funny things. Like moving, moving jobs to America. This crazy company, what are they thinking? I can't <laughs> moving, believe it. They're moving manufacturing jobs to America. What a terrible company. Sorry, I'm, I have to bash Apple no matter what they do. That's just the rules around here. No, it's it's, it's kind of cool. Tim Cook says that they're willing to invest $100 million, which is like 0.001% of what he has in his bank account. But he's going to invest $100 million uh, to bring some jobs over to the country. And they're going to be like building uh, Max, Mac, Mac, whatever the things. <laughs> I don't know. They're going to be building Macs, not like iPads or anything like that. IMAX. Some iMacs. of the 21-inch IMAX that, that just came out are marked assembled in America. He said they're going to work with a, a number of other companies, but hey, that's pretty cool. This is from October 31st. Happy Halloween, Apple. They sued a German cafe uh, due to the logo. Let's take a look at this logo here. Apfelkind. I, I, I don't know if I said that right. If you guys are uh, in Deutschland, let me know if that's correct or not, but there it is. Look look at that logo. Look how similar that is. In fact, I'm so confused that I might walk in there to buy an iPad and walk out with a muffin not knowing what happened. That's not the German Apple Store logo? Oh my god. Yeah, I totally thought that was the Apple Store. And then I see that little girl there with her, with her hat on, with her baking cap or whatever? No, that, that just, that's totally all Apple computer. The, Apple has a history of doing this. This school here in, um, where they, in Canada, uh, several years ago, Apple almost put this, this private... Uh, college out of business because they were suing them over that logo that clearly looks just like the Apple logo. Bad. Bad Apple. Stop it. <laughs> okay, I think I've sufficiently scolded Apple. Moving right along here. Oh, our, our favorite our favorite congressman, uh, Lamar Smith. Uh, we, we're like your little fan club here. We love what you're doing. We love the fact that you know nothing about science, and we love the fact that you wrote SOPA. And we love the fact that you're a, clim a climate skeptic. He's going to be the guy in charge of the science committee for Congress. <laughs> That's awesome. And the main reason that he's going to, is, it's not because of his science background, it's because he reached the term limit in the other committee that he's on. So it's like, damn, where do we put him? Oh, let's put him well, in science. Well, they have to keep him because he'll do anything they say. Like the other guys who, who need somebody who does whatever they say. He, this is the kid in high school that if you took like, you know, a mallow cup or whatever, they even make those anymore. But no. back in his day, they had mallow cups, okay? It was so old. And good humor bar. They had a good humor bar, okay? He's from Boston now or wherever. And they used to smash like a roach on the bottom and be like, hey, Lamar, want to eat this? He'd be like, no way, man. They'd be like, 10 bucks. And he'd be like, Give it to me. That's why they need Lamar Smith. He's that guy. He's the guy who would eat roaches and ants on the bottom of Mallow Cups and Good Huma Boss. Lamar Smith brought to you by SOPA. So there. He's our hero there. Mm, yeah. Just make sure you don't vote him back into office, please, guys. That's all we really wanted to say here. Yeah, he was against the Kyoto Protocol, so I mean, good lord. <laughs> he likes he SUVs. He seems like the logical choice to be in charge of science, because, you know. And the article actually mentions that he won some sort of science award in high school. You know, oh, yeah, he did like a volcano with vinegar and all that stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, good lord. It smelled like vinegar for a week. It was worth it because now look <laughs> at him. <laughs> that was the most epic volcano that they had ever seen in that school. Ever. <laughs> and he won an award. Clearly. That's probably a yellow ribbon. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> oh, what a catastrophe. Oh, God, I love this picture. That's why we're at geeksorsexy.com instead of anywhere else because they have this picture on their thing. It makes me happy. So Windows decided, or Microsoft decided, that they were going to try to start a meme it was anti-Android, so they created this hashtag called Android Rage, and uh, it turned into <laughs> Windows Rage because people would reply. That you were supposed to go on there and like say something bad about Android and reply with the hashtag on Twitter, Android Rage. And yep. then everybody started saying really terrible things about Windows and replying with the Android Rage and a Windows Rage hashtag so they would appear in both feeds. So go ahead and read a couple of these. These are hilarious. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's like... Uh, Windows Rage is when you cannot fix your operating system and instead publish your own virus malware scanner. Or, you know, I once thought about writing a malware for a Windows phone, but I thought, uh, aren't they suff suffering enough? <laughs> That's my favorite one there from Mohammed. Uh, I need George Bush to say these things. I mean, honestly, who thought it was a good idea at Microsoft to talk about malware? 
I mean, really, they've, that's been a problem since Windows 95. That's like a, that's more, it's a 15 year problem. You know, I don't know what's going on in the world right now, but there's a lot of really funny stuff happening in the marketing area. It's like they've, I, I don't know. It's like these companies. There was some really funny things that went on with Hitman this week that just made me like totally like laugh. Just the marketing decisions that are that are happening. It's it's great. So remember we talked about Microsoft and their extremely creepy patent where they could watch you with the Kinect. Well, this is even more interesting. Well, not really more interesting. It's on the same level, but it's a very creepy patent as well. Verizon has filed for a patent uh, that will allow them to listen to you, listen to your conversations through their DVR, and then target the ads accordingly. So that, that could be a lot of fun. There's a very easy way to, uh, I guess, there's a very easy way to get around this. Don't buy the Verizon DVR. <laughs> I just solved your problems, guys. Hey, Verizon Rage, hashtag anybody, please. Or if you want to mess with them, you know, if, if you guys have any interest in <laughs> we this. We have some ideas. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If, if you guys have any interest in this, uh, maybe we could put an Arduino-based thing in the uh, store. Now, you guys may not have heard of it, but there's this thing called number stations. They have these radio stations in Europe that are probably run by spy agencies, but they just read numbers all day. So you tune 17, in. 17, 24, 173, 7. Yeah, it's exactly two, like that. 14, 11. So our plan is to take an Arduino, pipe one of those into the Verizon thing, and then see what sort of ads come out. It'll be great. I want to know what kind of ads are going to be in frat houses. <laughs> <laughs> you know it's going to be like, <laughs> the pool stick that will fit in your butt. <laughs> While drunk. <laughs> That's what will be the, yeah. Uh, oh, we should play the clip uh, from the Daily Show about the, uh, what was butt chugging? <laughs> butt chugging? <laughs> butt chugging! <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> No, we're not going to play any butt chugging clips from. Maybe we will later. Uh, the city of Munich, in uh, in Germany, Deutschland. What do you guys prefer? Tell me. Um, they they've saved over twelve million dollars by switching to Linux. I thought I was going to say Geico, but I didn't. <laughs> hey, no no unpaid plugs. <laughs> exactly. Somebody said we were we were sponsored the other day by no. beer. Of course, they were like, "You guys are getting sponsored by beer." Like, no. No, it's the, beer, the beer makes the show worse, not better. That'd be nice. Uh, write Cheryl about that if you... Uh... <laughs> yeah, Cheryl at <laughs> Yeah. So they've switched over to Linux. They saved a lot of money, and they saved a ton of money on licensing uh, fees, but they're not sure if it's going to work or not because OpenOffice... They're having some problems like interfacing with OpenOffice and uh, regular Office. So what do you think is going to happen with this? Uh, well, I think if they stick it out, they'll probably be okay. But, you know, OpenOffice has been a little bit of a hurdle for them. It's not really the operating system. It's just Office. Office is what's holding them on Windows, which if you're at Microsoft now, you should be panicking. Yeah, because that's really the only thing that's holding people there. And it's really just because everyone has it and they need the compatibility and the ability to share files with everyone in the world. So And features. The yeah. OpenOffice apparently doesn't have some of the features they're looking for. So if I was OpenOffice, I would be doing everything I could right now. There's an article on Ars Technica right now about how millions are getting scammed by uh, these people who are online selling non-existent cars and non-existent uh, motorhomes. Now, I'm usually not a victim blamer. In fact, I think victim blaming is something that's extremely bad and it happens all the time in this con country. But, guys, you're not gonna get a freaking new BMW or a new Lexus for half price or $10,000. And you're not gonna get it sight unseen and the people that you're buying it from have these mysterious overseas accounts and they're sending you fake you know like websites that aren't even really ebay it's like efay and you're like oh let me just go ahead and pay my ten thousand and you pay ten thousand dollars and then you complain after after your money's gone you're like i never got my lexus for half price so how are they going to ship that bmw from uh nigeria how, i think that? people get caught up in some sort of a craze where they're like oh my god oh my god look what i can have and they, it's like greed comes in and then you get all excited and there's like this I, I don't know, but it's. I think that it has something to do with the psychological weirdness that happens in your brain when you think you're getting such an amazing deal. Yeah, it's, well, uh, some of these people, some of these victims have been waiting like four and five and six months because it was like, oh, well, it is going to take a long time for it to arrive here from, you know, Nigeria. And they didn't say a word for five or six months. Yeah, at which point it's pretty much impossible to do any kind of reverse transaction or anything. Clever. Very clever. An alternative to Kickstarter has surfaced. Now, this uh, new website is called Christie Street. It is online now, and it has been developed by serial entrepreneur Jamie Siminoff. Now, here's what's interesting about this. With Kickstarter, there's a lot of problems because there's not a lot of accountability. If you have a project, and it's a, maybe a big project that's you know, like something technical or something that requires a lot of work on the part of the, uh, I guess, the person doing the Kickstarter, 
Well, you're going to have to have a lot of faith in that person, especially if you're giving them, giving them a large sum of money. You may never see your money again, and that product may never actually happen. They already found us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, they're gone. Uh, I guess they're going to go around front. We should be able to finish before they get inside. The, they got the <laughs> robots to fight in your lobby. Um, anyway, so with Christie Street, they aim to fix several of those problems. And here's what you can do. When a project gets funded on Christie Street, the recipient of the money gets the money in three installments. So that way, if things are going wrong, the investors can get their money back. They won't get all of it back, but they'll be able to get a portion of it back. Furthermore, for 10% of whatever you're going to pay, you get insurance. And then you can get all of your money back. So they've got an insurance system and then a system where they give the money out. This is really nice yeah, because on Kickstarter, there's too many. There's, it's too often that you have some charismatic type who's like, I've got a fusion reactor and we're going to build this. I just need $3 million. And then he gets the $3 million and then he's gone. So how long do you think it's going to take Kickstarter to do the same thing? About three weeks. Yeah. They've been looking for something like this and this guy just showed up and did it. And then Kickstarter is going to do it and, and I don't know. Christie Street's an interesting name though, I suppose. So here it is. There's uh, one project right now, Doorbot. Interesting. This is a much better way to do it, probably. Yep. Actually, if this guy plays his cards right, one thing that could separate him from Kickstarter is he could have, like, if he makes enough money, he could put experts on staff, engineers and uh, electrical engineers and mechanical engineers and things to like look that. To, to, to uh, check the validity of each project? Yep. That'd be a great idea. I know there's several categories on Kickstarter, like some of the engineering categories have been cut out because those categories were just not working out. Yeah. You know? I have a perpetual motion machine. I only need $1 million <laughs> to move to the Cayman Islands, never to be seen again. Hmm, we're in the wrong line of business. Yeah, pretty much. All right, let's talk about Kim.com, one of our friends. He's, <laughs> he's just been granted um, the ability to sue the police and echelon. Hi, Spooks. Hello. Hi, how are you guys doing? I know you're watching because you heard that word. Yeah, you heard that word. It was auto-transcribed. It's been flagged, and now you have to watch this, so hopefully you're entertained. Yeah, we mean you no harm, guys. I mean, it's cool. Look at my data. So the, the cool thing about the Kim.com thing is that the courts are actually acknowledging this international spy network that was spying on him, and he's got discovery rights. His lawyers can discover what evidence they have. And so they, they had a minor wig out. Yeah, so here's what happened with the minor wig out. So, of course, you know, Echelon and the also the, the New Zealand police and everything were saying, like, hey, we can't give them, you know, all this information. It's going to be, you know, it's going to create gonna a national... It's going to be an international incident. It's going to be an international security incident is what it's going to be. And so the judge was like, no, 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 it, it's cool. We're going to send this guy over named Stuart Grieve. Now, Stuart Grieve is going to rifle through all their files. Rifle or rifle? All, all rifle. Mm, right well, here. I mean, depends on what country you're from. Oh, that's right. I see I get so many correspondences. So, yeah, so this, this guy Grieve is going to be looking through all their files, and he will determine what is, you know, needed in court and what is not, but he gets to see everything. He gets to see all the stuff they collected on him. Mm -hmm. And they collected quite a bit, from what we understand. Yeah, for many, many years, you know, Echelon was like the tinfoil hat thing, where it was like, no, Echelon doesn't exist. There's not an international spying thing for electronic communications. That's crazy. And then here we have, oh, Echelon was the system. Yeah, Kim.com, uh, he's, and he's just like taking it to the government. He loves it. It seems like he really loves this stuff. Yeah, he's really doing it in such a way that he's, you know, earning the hearts and minds of the people in well, New Zealand. Today he retweeted something that I guess one of his friends or someone, I don't know if it was a member of the press or one of his friends, but someone retweeted, uh, take down this government and the new government will bow to you, Kim. <laughs> and he retweeted this and I was like, oh God, Kim. Kim. He, he had the open letter to Hollywood too. He was like, you know, dear Hollywood, this is how you do business on the internet. <laughs> Kim.com is just like, he's loving this stuff and he's just, he, I think he likes to fight. He does. So, yeah, he's having a lot of fun with that. This is what's <laughs> going on in the world right now, guys. Uh, just this whole, like, fight over the Internet and how it works. So that's really what we're talking about. Uh, the UN summit met, um, and now they are coming out in full support of Internet eavesdropping, meaning deep packet inspection. Now, we did a, a video on packet inspection, and there's a link right here on the screen to that video. You guys can watch that video. It'll give you an idea of what packet inspection is and how it works and what they can do with it. But this stuff's been going on for a very long time, and it's really nothing new. It's just now they're making it legal, and maybe they'll make retroactively legal, you know, for everything they have been doing. But this stuff's been going on for a long time. It's really nothing new. The other thing that kind of, you know, is worrisome is the fact that now they may be able to censor the internet, uh, and they're all going to be able to do this legally and with the, you know, with the pat on the back from the UN. What the deep packet inspection and packet sniffing means for your average Joe is that your ISP can mine all of your unencrypted traffic, all of your unencrypted data, and use it for whatever purposes. 
And there are plenty of ways around that. And we just finished a new security video on Tor and Freenet. And we'll be releasing that video very soon that should give you some ideas uh, for a few ways that you can, you know, you know, you can work around all this nonsense. But for the most part, you guys are not doing anything that really merits this much security. I mean, for most of you guys, it's fine. Just know that it's on their end. It's a slippery slope because once they deny your privacy, they can look through anything on your computer, including like your naked pictures of you and your friends. Your privacy is like an avalanche. You know, no one snowflake feels responsible for the avalanche. And so no one... No one piece of your privacy violated is, but, you know, the aggregate is an avalanche or something. So, guys, what I'm really trying to say here is all those sexy parties that you have on weekends, just make sure that those files are encrypted on your hard drive. That's all. Then you're fine. And you exchange them in an encrypted format. Unless you're like my Miami friends who just posted on Facebook and you're like, <laughs> well, it looks like you had a sexy party. It's not even censored. Then the next day when they sober up, it's all of a sudden gone. I really love the Onion article about the uh, CIA program known as Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> There's been some opposition to what the UN is doing. In fact, one of the uh, the biggest voices, or one of the most important voices, is Vince Cerf. Now, Vince Cerf is the co-creator of the Internet. He's now the uh, Internet evangelist at Google. And he had a lot of interesting things to say about this. I'll put a link to this on the screen. He is um, the man for yeah, the Internet. He really is the man. And he really he helped create the Internet. He understands what it's about. Others have proposed moving the responsibilities of the private sector systems that manage uh, manages domain names and internet addresses to the United Nations, yet the proposals would require any internet content provider, small or large, to pay new tolls in order to reach people across borders, and that is very, very bad. And they, they want to, like, instill the old telecommunications nonsense into the internet and, and turn it into a system like that, and that's just not going to work, and it's not going to... I don't think this is ever going to happen, and if it does happen, it's just not going to happen in the way that... It, it can't happen. We'll find ways around it, guys. It's not that big a deal. Like The internet isn't built that way. Stop it. Yeah, at this point, I'm like watching them. I'm like, guys, what are you doing? We're just, we're just gonna, whatever you do, we're just gonna break it. That's what's gonna happen. Is we're gonna break it, and you all need to be calling your ISPs and asking for IPv6. Like that's something that you can do. That's gonna be a very positive thing. Like all of you, just pick up your phone and say, listen, I'm gonna switch providers as soon as somebody else has IPv6, and then they'll be very quick to get IPv6, and then we're all okay. Everything's fine. No, nothing to worry about. IPv6 means we can do SSL everywhere. So we can encrypt everything if we have IPv6. There's not enough IP addresses to do every website in SSL. Yeah. So we got SSL now. Enjoy. There's also some opposition from the US of A. They don't want the UN to touch their internet. Their internet, that is. It's pretty interesting. They had a vote and uh, in the House, and it was 397 to 0 against uh, the UN's regulation of the internet. And here's what I want to quote from them. Um, they said, in other words, the United States of America is totally unified on this issue of an open structure, a multi-stakeholder approach that has guided the Internet over the last two decades. Let me translate that. The U.S. is telling the U.N. we got this because they have been doing things on the Internet for a very long time. They've got systems that work. They like the Internet being free because then people are more, you know, it, they, they understand that people are going to be driven underground. People send things. People receive things. The government can watch it already in the USA, and they're fine with this. That's that's what I think. If you are got a .com, because that goes through Virginia, we can shut you down. .com, .org, .org .net. All of it goes through Verisign in Virginia. So I think the UN, I mean, the U.S. clearly just wants the UN to keep their grimy hands off of their internet. Mine. So it's, it's perhaps not really a better situation, but probably doing nothing is better than doing something. Yeah. And, you know, at least if the U.S. has their way, maybe we'll start seeing some, some crackdowns on dot-coms and stuff, but it won't be like a what the what the U.N. is proposing. with the. Uh, it's just a mess. All right, let's talk about some hardware. Uh, this is kind of exciting. The A&D Trinity overclocked to 7.3 gigahertz. That's freaking absurd, so we had to mention it. Uh, it's an A10 5800K APU. Those things are actually pretty fast, uh, especially for like 120 bucks. And the fact that the GPU is on board, that's faster than a lot of like the... 80 90 dollar gpus you could just get that one cpu and have everything done it's a quad core so what's interesting about this is that you know at that price range you can still get it to around five gigahertz on air i think we need to get one of those to play with yeah we need that i i, I really want to play with one of those i know there's i know of course there's like more powerful options out there if you want to get a dedicated you know gpu and a dedicated uh, faster cpu like an i5 or something 
but for the money guys if you're building a system um we did another video on this like a 300 dollars gaming gaming rig we did like a cheap ass gaming rig too you guys can check those out if you're building a system for christmas or for holidays or hanukkah or kwanzaa or yule I, you know i hate this time of year everybody just <laughs> shut up and have fun and drink your eggnog all your holidays <laughs> The wild hunt is what we'll, we'll It's not a holiday unless you're drunk. <laughs> We're doing the wild hunt around here, and yes, we will be drunk with spears out in the yard. <laughs> uh, this is from Cosmos Magnus. Uh, he posted this on the uh, forum. He, he got an AMD Phenom 2 X6 1605T to um, 6163.34 megahertz. So it's a hell of a job, dude. He's down there in uh, Tennessee. You should come up and uh, we should do some overclocking up here. One of our members on the forum. What's really to... crazy is there, these speeds from these CPUs on air. I mean, that, that shows that AMD. Well, this is got... this is not air, but oh well. The five gigahertz was on air, but seven point three was not on air. And this one, I think he said he did this with uh, with nitrogen. Yeah, the seven. Oh well, nitrogen. Yeah. yeah. But the five gigahertz air overclock shows that AMD's got a lot of headroom in that part. Now we've got this one here. It's an eighty-one twenty. We've got this overclocked to four point three gigahertz. By the way, this is the last time you guys are going to see this. It's going to Jordan. Jordan, if you're watching, dude, I'm sorry that it has taken so long. We had a uh, shipping snafu uh, with the Asus products, a few shipping snafus, and it took like forever to get the the motherboard and the graphics card. But they're here. We overclocked the hell out of them. We installed some custom stuff. So I hope you enjoy it. Anyway, we got this thing overclocked to four point three, and it's running at like fifty degrees on full load. After five hours. After Yeah, we let it run all day, Prime 95. All day. We went to lunch. We came back. We hung out. We goofed off. 50 degrees. It got up to like 53. That's amazing. Yeah. So <laughs> 4.3 gigahertz. And we can push the hell out of this thing. But we're just going to leave it at 4.3 for you. It's stable. Uh, I'm going to let it run overnight with Prime 95 and just make sure that it's stable. And you know what? I overclocked the graphics card as well on this. As high as I could possibly get it. The, the program wouldn't let me go any higher. So these cards are just... My stuff's overclocking like crazy, man. It makes me happy. All right, speaking of overclocking, you guys will be doing overclocking well into the future. AMD says that they are committed to socket CPUs at least through 2014. So at least for the next couple of years, you're going to have socket CPUs. They came out because, you know, Intel said, no, we're not going to be doing any more. Um, you know, just everything's going to be on chip, no more sockets. And then Intel immediately came out and said, whoa, 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 whoa. We're committed to sockets too. So that was very uh, Texas, wasn't it? <laughs> George Bush. <laughs> You know, we are uh, we're committed to sockets. I'd say the reality there is that Intel will give OEMs the option of no socket. Like, you can have a... You can buy a Dell, and then it'll come yeah. everything pre-configured. It'll be cheaper. But there'll also be socket options to CPU, which is honestly, that was probably the plan all along. That's what they've, they've already been doing that, I mean, to a certain extent. If you get a laptop and that sort of thing, they're just, just going to put laptop boards into desktops because laptop yeah. boards are getting powerful enough that if you're buying a desktop from Dell for an office, you do not need this. And Apple certainly seems to be headed that way with their new, you know, non-upgradable iMacs. Yeah. So this is all expected. and Everything's fine. Everything's fine. Let's talk about some science, shall we? SpaceX has a military contract now. I knew this was coming. I knew it. Because NASA's, you know, like, they're kind of just like, I don't know what to do, everything's bad. Uh, well, they've been needing to put a satellite. Uh, they actually want to put a satellite between here and the sun so they can look back at the Earth with the sun behind it. And SpaceX got the contract. Now, SpaceX, have been buying, SpaceX has been buying for several different contracts, you know, like whether military or you know, government, whatever. So it's kind of cool they got one. Who knows where this is going to go. And uh, speaking of government contracts, there's a new company that's going to be flying into outer space. Now, the new company is called Golden Spike. Well, I want to know where that name com comes from. I, I need to, like, figure that out. Anyway, the guys on the board, some of the guys are from NASA. Some Newt Gingrich is one, one of the advisors. But this company is supposed to be taking people to the moon. And they're not, not targeting, like, you know, commercial applications and people and random nonsense and rich people who want to fly up there and, you know, play golf on the moon or whatever. They're targeting governments. So they, could, they said they're going to be targeting east and west. So it could be China. It could be here. This reads like a rail company that wanted to set up, you know, like rail routes, except they want a, a moon route. Yeah. It's going to cost them 7 to $8 billion, and, I mean, who knows if it's really going to happen. Well, if they could figure out a quote-unquote train route to the moon, then we could start exploiting its natural resources. Oh, yeah, there's oil up there. Well, helium-3. No, I'm pretty sure there's oil. That's why we need to go there. Yeah, actually, that would be really good. If we went there, we could get the oil, we could liberate the people. Well, if the, if the right people are still watching this, if you guys are still watching, there is oil up there. And I'm pretty sure there's a madman up there oppressing people, and he's got weapons of mass destruction. We should go. We need democracy up there now. Yeah, we got to go. Come on, they're being oppressed. Let's go. Let's get our freaking American flags and go. Come on. That's a bumper sticker right there. Democracy on the moon now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's talk about <laughs> video games. 
Happy 15th birthday to Quake 2. That's going to be yesterday because today's the birthday and you guys aren't going to see this until tomorrow, but whatever. Happy birthday, Quake 2. The game's still awesome. If you go to a LAN party, load up Quake 2 and everyone will be happy. Very happy. It's like, play some Instagib with the railgun. It still satisfies. So that's pretty cool. And there's an article here to talk about that. And uh, so we just talked about a really old game. Let's talk about a game that's not out yet. Check it, take a look at some of these screenshots from the uh, next Crisis game, Crisis 3. This is concept art, mind you. They, they make it look real. This, this cannot be real. Is this real or con? They said some of it's real, some of it's concept art, but that looks like it might be... I need to read this. To quote that crazy Florida lawyer, oh, that looks like Murder Simulator 2014. It is. It's Murder Simulator 2014. So, Murder Simulator 2014 will be out soon, and it's so realistic that uh, when actually when you kill someone in the game, someone in another country dies. <laughs> <laughs> We've got robotic soldiers on the ground. Yeah, I mean that's it, Crytek can do it. They they really they worked on this engine for a long time, and they worked on the implants that are going to the into the uh, yeah robots and whatnot. Uh, you know the IGF is the Independent Games Festival. Well, they do it every year. In 2013, Valve is going to be offering uh, distribution deals to all the finalists in each category. So if you've got an indie game and you've entered it into the uh, IGF, you may be on Steam. It's, I guess it's almost like a like a green light, quick quick way into green light or whatever, like a back door. You get that, that's really you cool. bypass green light, you're on there, blam. That's going to be a way for Steam to make oodles and oodles of money and get quality content. And, you know, give these independent developers who obviously deserve some recognition, give them some recognition and some money in their pocket to make future games. So this seems like a win, 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 win. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see how the ecosystem of Steam's environment plays out with this because the numbers on Apple's App Store came out. Yeah. And uh, it was like 50% uh, of the App Store revenue goes to only 25 companies. That's so, pretty intense. Yeah, that's really insane. Hmm. I wonder if Steam will be like that. They're pretty tight with their numbers. Yeah. They, they don't really release anything. All they say is we're doing well and we made <laughs> and we made two hundred million dollars on Team Fortress Two hats. They had to tell someone that because it was like they were about to burst. They were like, I can't believe we made it. I can't believe we did this. Can I tell someone? Okay, fine. Tell somebody we made two hundred million on hats. Yeah. The, the only reason they talked about the hats is just because they made so much money from it and everybody thought it was the dumbest idea ever. And so Gabe was like, Oh yeah, well let's take a look at. It. Oh look, it wasn't so dumb now, was it? And some of the guys who were making like hats and items, they were making like almost 100 grand these I think, like kids who were just making uh, making items for team fortress 2 i think they published um a paper that said you know we could have made this much money selling team fortress 2 at a discounted rate but instead we made this much money giving it away for free and selling hats and it was like 10 times what we would have made the other <laughs> way so they, they really rubbed it in yeah that's wonderful all right guys uh Zvihander is doing really well you, you know like last week it was on the front page for the electronica section on bandcamp but as far as the best sellers go it was like number five or six on the list for best sellers on bandcamp so thank you guys so much for checking out Zvihander. that's the music the eight-bit music that's at the beginning and end and i know there's one guy out there that hates it because this one guy posted posted on a few videos your videos are awesome except that sucky music so one guy that hates it deal with it we disagree with what you say but we will defend to the death you're right to say it Indeed, sir. Unlike a democracy that we have in America. <laughs> um, got some t-shirts and all that crap. And, oh, we're going to give away a mouse. So we'll do the mouse giveaway in the next inbox that I'm going to be filming, like, immediately after this, this is over. So there's the mouse. And I think we'll maybe give something else away in that one as well. So I'll let you guys know in the inbox video. Now you have to watch it. You see what I just did there? <laughs> you have no choice. We're not, we're not very good at marketing, as it turns out. Yeah. It's like you, you, you gotta watch. We'll give you stuff. Just watch. Please watch and share. You should watch it because you love it. And if you're doing it for any other reason, you're a bad person. Okay, I'll see you guys next time. So where's the subscri subscribe button down here now, right? Yeah, I think they moved it to the bottom. Wherever the hell YouTube decides to put it, just there it is. See you guys next time. <laughs>